Hi online family, Maddie here. We're here at church getting ready for Sunday and I'm so excited that you're a part of this message. We're a church that loves God, loves people and loves life. And I'm praying that this message is gonna speak to you, it's gonna inspire you and uplift you in your journey in life. So why don't you go ahead and share it with someone in your world and let's be all a part of what God is doing together. Well, good morning, church. How are we this morning? Yeah? Doing good? We alive? You ready for the word? If you've got your Bibles, why don't you open with me to Joshua? We're in the book of Joshua right now as a church, journeying through the book of Joshua together. We've been in John, Joshua chapter 1 to today, Joshua chapter 3. So if you've got your Bibles, open with me to Joshua chapter 3. We're going to continue our series, War. A journey through the book of Joshua, a story of conquest, a story of overcoming, a story of God's faithfulness in the lives of his people. Are you enjoying the series? Is anyone enjoying the series or is it just me? I'm getting a lot out of it. I, I feel like God's speaking and it's pretty cool. Got the whiteboard up here for the, all the <clears throat> studious types in the room. In reading from the New Living Translation, Joshua 3 and verse 1, it says this, Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp, giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, Move out from your positions and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Stay about half a mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. Verse 5, then Joshua told the people, Purify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. In the morning, Joshua said to the priests, Lift up the ark of the covenant and lead the people across the river. And so they started out and went ahead of the people. The Lord told Joshua, today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. Verse 8, give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. Verse 9, so Joshua told the Israelites, come and listen to what the Lord your God says. Today you will know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, the Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. A lot of ites. Ahead of you, look, the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you across the Jordan River. Now choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, each from one tri- each from each, sorry, one from each tribe, the priests will carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. As soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of the water will cut off upstream and the river will stand up like a wall. Powerful story, powerful moment for God's people. I want to preach part three of our series, War. This is the title today. If you want to write it down, here we go. This is the title. There's no turning back now. That's the title of the message. There's no turning back now. Turn to the person next to you and say, there's no turning back now. We're in church. We're sitting down. There's no turning back. We can't leave now. That's it. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we thank you that because we've seen Jesus, because we've had a glimpse of Jesus, there is no turning back. That, that, that our lives have been completely turned around to a whole new way of seeing, a whole new way of living. Our hearts are completely born again, Lord. And so, Father, we thank you for Jesus today, and we pray that this message, this, these words would speak, that they would just illuminate all over again just the beauty and the majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, in a faith-filled church said, Amen. So we've been in this series, a couple of quick themes just to recap brought about this sort of thought from part number one of our series, but it was this thought, if I'm under attack, I'm right on track. In this life, there will be battles. Why? Because we're part of the war. 
Paul called the war that we're in the ministry of reconciliation. We're battling for the war of souls of people, believing for them to come into the kingdom of God. And we're believing as well as we journey through life that we're going to experience overcoming life in Jesus' name. And at times, if you're overcoming and taking territory, spiritually speaking, then someone's losing territory, spiritually speaking. It's a battle. So if you're under attack or you feel opposition or you feel like there's something coming at you, can I just encourage you? You're probably right where you need to be because God is on your side, but it's a battle and it's going to take some overcoming. So if you feel like you're under attack, you're right on track. The second thought was this, is God has a way of doing things. We talked about this last week in the story of Joshua chapter 2. Joshua knew he'd been there before. He'd seen the series before. He'd seen the, the, the movie before. But God has a way. He likes to do things. God has a process. He has a plan. And there comes a point in our own lives we have to decide, is it going to be my way or is it going to be God's way? He has a plan. God has a way that he likes to do things. So part number three is there's no turning back. Joshua tells his people, he says, purify yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do great wonders among you. This is the story, the crossing over story for God's people This chapter, chapter three that we're studying this week, and if you haven't signed up for the devotional that that drops on Friday, can I just encourage you, they're fantastic. It's a good, solid length of devotional that comes out each Friday out of our church, comes from our team. They've done an amazing job, sign up for it. But uh, chapter three is this week. But this is the moment we see the crossing over. This is where they've finally arrived. They're at the banks of the Jordan River. I mean, think about just being there for a moment. Put yourself in the story. Could you imagine The people are following Joshua, but there's this big change that's about to take place. The people of God are going to go from being in the wilderness to the land of promise. But to get there, it's going to take some crossing over. It's going to take a step change. It's going to take a line in the sand that they're going to cross over. You know, lines in the sand, they're apparent in our lives, but they're not very often in our lives. You ever notice that? That there could, there could be step changes in your life. Maybe you could think of one right now. I remember big changes in my life, big stepping over moments in my life. I remember when I asked Jill to marry me. Thank God she said yes. I remember I, I prayed and I believed for God to give me a wife. And then I, he gave me a wife. But I had to propose to her to make her my wife. But it was a crossing over moment because to me there was no turning back. Well, there would have been if she said no, but you know what I'm saying. I can think of another time when we were newly married and believing that we're going to step into this new career in the financial industry in Australia, but I would have to leave my old job. This, in, this opportunity came and it was, it was risky. There was faith that was required. There wasn't any um, necessarily any outside assurances of everything working out, but I knew God had brought it into my world and it was part of my pathway to promise, but I had to step out in faith. I had to cross over into faith. I just remember that as a crossing over moment for me. I remember when we started this church. I had to cross over in faith. Believe God had put it as a pathway to promise for us, but there was a crossing over moment I can still remember it. I can still remember the time in prayer where I said to God, I was like, God, even if only a few people show up, we're still going to do this. We're going to cross over. We're believing that you're pointing us this way and in this direction, and we're going to cross over this river in Jesus' name. But we all have moments like this. We all have. And maybe you can just think right now, some crossing over moments. Can you think of some? Can you think of some times in your own life where you just know, looking back, you're like, man, that was a crossing over moment. That was a moment where I crossed over in faith because I believed God and I trusted Him that He would bring about this new thing into my life. There are moments of crossing over. When your spirit knows today is the day, listen to me, that I go to a place I have never been before. I'm not talking naturally, I'm talking spiritually. I'm talking like I've never been this place before, but I know that the Holy Spirit, God is leading me to that place. But the beauty of this story, when you read about it, it's not like the people were on their own. 
And it's not like today, if you have a crossing over moment, you're on your own. No, it's actually right here in the text. God went with them. Verse seven, the Lord told Joshua, today I will begin, begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. But look at the second part of the verse. They will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. See, this was the moment of crossing over for God's people, but God would cross over with them. But it absolutely was the crossing moment. I just want you to write this thought down, just, to, just something to think about. My pathway to promise, come on, write it down. My pathway to promise always requires a crossing over. It's always going to require a crossing over of some kind. That's the faith journey. And there's a reason that God does it this way. There's a reason that God decided in all of his sovereignty, in all of his, you know, being God, that he, would, he decides that there has to be a crossing over my moment. Why? Because it's all about trust. I got my little whiteboard here, pretty excited about it. Happens maybe once a year, so soak it up. But there's a reason that God did it through the Jordan River. Obviously, we know in the New Testament, Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. But the Jordan River is a significant um, part of the land of Israel because it flows from the Sea of Galilee, which is up here. I'm going to do it right there. I think we've got a little flyover to put in the background. But just picture this as to scale the sea. No, it's not. Uh, this is the Sea of Galilee right here. And that's where it begins. And it just flows north to south all the way down and drains into the Dead Sea down here. And then this is the Mediterranean Sea over here. Picture beautiful sea. Yeah, look at that. Look at those waves. <laughs> beautiful. I should, I should work for a tourism company or something. I'm just so good at selling this. Middle Eastern tourism. Over here is Tel Aviv on the coast, which is in the Bible is called Joppa. Over here is Jerusalem somewhere here. Jericho is right about here. And this is where the people of God were, right there. <laughs> Look at it. That's beautiful. I don't think we should ever rub that out. I mean, oh, there it is. See, I just drew it perfectly. What a surprise. But there's a reason that God did it this way. And that's, that's because this strip of land, north to south, where the promised land was, where the people of God would enter in, where they would begin to take over and take possession of, this was a coveted strip of land. Had the Mediterranean on one side, which was the best way to get, to, to have access, and then the Jordan River on the other side, and the desert beyond that. But no one had ever conquered this strip of land this way. Ever. If you think about the Assyrians came in from the north, Babylon came from the north, um, Greece came from the north, Rome came from the north. At the south is Egypt, the Egyptians came from the south. No one had ever gone in the side door. But God meant for them to go in that way. It was on purpose, they were on mission. They did it exactly the way that God wanted to do it. But from a military perspective, this was the dumbest strategy of all time. This was like the all or nothing moment for God's people. And this is why, because he stopped the waters of the Jordan River. He stopped it. So they could go over. But here's the problem is you've got enemies to the north. You've got enemies to the south. You've got enemies right in front of you. And you've got a body of water. Once you're in, is right behind you. You can't get out. Because there is no turning back. You've crossed over. I don't know if you've ever walked into these seasons in life where you've crossed over and you've realized, man, once I go over, that's it. Once I step into the promise that God has for me, that's it. I can't do anything else. I've got no other options. You ever notice when it comes to crossing over a bridge for us as, as human beings, like when we cross over a bridge, we can always go back across the bridge. When I go up to Jacksonville, across the bridge in Jacksonville, I'm glad that I can go back to St. Augustine across, can I get an amen? amen. We're a St. Augustine church, better believe it. <laughs> but God doesn't work that way. See, for God, it's, it's, it's one way. And then there's no way back. And that's exactly what God intended for his people to do, that they would go over this way, 
in the complete weakest spot with enemies all around them. But why? I've got three reasons why God did it this way. Are you ready? These are the three reasons that God did it this way is because he was testing Israel. This was a mammoth test. This was like the test of all tests. He was testing their faith, obedience. If you're going to cross over into the promise that God has for you, if you're going to step out and do that thing that God has called you to do, if you're going to go out of your way to step out and trust God, you've got to understand something that that, that it's a test. It's a test of faith. And it was for God's people. He was testing them. He was testing their faith, obedience. And these are themes that we see all through the book of Joshua is faith and testing and obedience and overcoming. The second reason that he did it this way was because he was displaying his power to the whole world. He was displaying his miracle working power. The other thing about this crossing, this particular crossing, was it says that they went across on dry ground. So yes, he dried up the waters, he stopped up the waters further upstream, but they didn't walk across the mud. It was on dry ground. It was amazing. It was on dry ground. The other thing about it was that he never, he never allowed his people to use um, horses and chariots. In terms of ancient means of warfare, I mean, like, you're saying, God, we can just use donkeys? That's it? Yes. They were the donkey nation. <coughs> Excuse me. But that was, that was on purpose. That was on mission. God intended it to be like that. Why? Because he was displaying his power. He was showing the whole world. Can I just encourage you when it comes to your faith step, when it comes to your crossing, you serve a God with unlimited power. You serve a God who can stop up the waters. You can serve a God who can give you something as simple as a donkey. And you'll overcome in Jesus' name. Can I get an amen? So that's the second reason. He's testing their faith. He was displaying his power. But third, he was messing with the enemies. He was messing with the minds of the enemies. He was playing into the minds of the enemies. You remember in Joshua chapter 2, we talked about it last week. Remember Rahab's confession? Do you remember what she said to the two spies? She said, man, we've heard about your God. We've heard about what he did with the Red Sea. We've heard about what you did with those kings. God has an amazing way of putting such a stamp and a seal on you that it's going to send a message to the whole world. You better not mess with this man of God. You better not mess with this woman of God. Why? Because you got God on your side. And that's pretty incredible. He was playing into the minds of the enemy. He was letting them know that things were about to change. But what does this crossing over mean to us? Well, simply this, it means death to self and trust in God. What's your Jordan River? What's your Jordan River? What's your crossing over to your promise? Maybe you're in here today and you're like, man, I I just really feel like God has put it on my heart to start a business. Maybe you're in here today and it's like, man, I just really, I'm believing you like I was when I was 20 years of age. I'm just believing God will give me a partner in life and a family. What is your Jordan River? What is your crossing over that needs to take place for you to step into what God has for you? What's your land? Because if a new season awaits, it's going to test you. It's absolutely going to show some display of God's power and not your power. And it's going to send a message to the world around you that you serve King Jesus and no one else. That's the thing about crossing over into the land of promise is you're not going to get the credit. You just get to be a part of it. You're not going to get the credit, but you get to be absolutely a part of it. But overcoming obstacles is part of the journey. And a new awareness comes in. And we see that it was God that got us here. God was the one that gave us. That's the the beauty about inheriting and being in your promised land is you sit there with an awareness. Oh my gosh, only by the grace of God did I get here? It's only by the grace of God that I'm leading a church in St. Augustine, Florida, in a place I'd never even heard of 10 years ago. 
But I sit here today and who gets all the credit? It's God. It's not me. I get to be a part of it. It's awesome. I'd love it if you could write this thought down. If God got you there, the devil can't make you leave. If God gets you there, if God is the one through his power and his miracles and his working and his leading, his breakthrough gets you into the land of your promise, your land of your possession, your overcoming life in Jesus' name. If he puts you there, the devil can't make you leave. He might be able to sow seeds of doubt and get you to maybe question it, but he can never make you leave. He can never dispossess you from your possession. See, Joshua knew what God was up to. And I love how Joshua leads his people through this crossing over moment in history. So drawing from the text, I wanted today to give us five ways that we can walk with an overcoming spirit, a crossing over spirit in Jesus' name. You ready for number one? How to have a crossing over spirit. The first thing we've got to do from the text right here is we've got to get up. We've got to get up. What does it say in verse one? It says, Joshua rose early in the morning. It's like my friend Michael says, you've got to get up to get down. I love that saying. You've got to get up. It doesn't mean that, that Joshua just thought, man, it's going to be a nice sunrise over the far sea of Galilee somewhere or coming down over. The... No, it's got nothing to do with getting out of bed early in the morning. It's about a posture. It's about a faith anticipation. It's about getting ready, being aware that God's about to do something. We could easily just skip over these words. It just says that he got up early, but it actually means it's about a, a, a position, a posture, a heart posture. In the message, it says Joshua was up early and on his way. It's the biblical language for getting alert and getting ready for the season ahead. You know, crossing over requires just as much mental preparation as it does physical preparation, just as much emotional preparation as it does natural or spiritual preparation. This is a battle and a battle requires a certain posture. What do you need to get up early for? What is God saying to you you need to get up early for? I'm not talking about getting out of bed early. I'm talking about arising early like Joshua, getting prepared having anticipation, man, God is going to do wonders today. Imagine if we woke up every day like that. We woke up every day. I'm challenging myself. I want to wake up every day and be like, man, what is God going to do today? How is he going to change the trajectory of my life today? Holy Spirit, what is God up to in my life today? What is going to happen? I'm ready. I'm awake. I'm alert. I'm fired up for the things of God today. It's going to change the way I go about my faith journey. We've got to get up because God is doing incredible things. Are you anticipating a move of God for your crossing? I, love, I just love this thought. I, I, I've been saying it for a long time, but I just think it's so good. My pastor said it a long time ago, and it's never left me. It's this, never let the level of your faith drop to the level of your experience. Never let the level of your faith drop to the level of your experience. We should always set our faith higher than anything we've experienced before. We should always look higher and say, God, I'm believing for more. God, I know you can do greater things. God, I know that the things that I've seen you do, they're just, they're just a foretaste of what's coming in the future. You're going to do more and more and more. We're going to get up. We're going to get ready. We're going to anticipate and expect God to move. So number one, we've got to get up. Number two, we've got to listen up. We're going to listen to what God has got to say. We're going to lean into the voice of God. In verse 7, it says, The Lord told Joshua, Today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of the people. This verse tells me a few things. It says, The Lord told Mosh, uh, Mosh Josh, you are. <laughs> tells me a few things that he was spending time with God. Because if Joshua was told by God, that means that he was with God or he's listening to God. He was spending time with God. So first of all, he was spending time with God and God had a message for him. God actually had something to say to Joshua. Can I just encourage you? God wants to say something to you. Sometimes we can live our lives and I don't know exactly where it comes from. Maybe we, sometimes we think that we're not good enough to hear from God or we think that we don't qualify to hear from God or we haven't been spiritual enough to hear from God. But listen to me, God wants to speak to you all the time. Yeah, right. He is up for a conversation anytime you want. 
And as we move through life, there's these moments where God wants to speak to us. He wants to say things to us. He wants to help us. But we need to be listening to the voice of God, listening for him to tell us to go, listening to, um, to, to listen to the sending message. The cool thing about this story is that God went with them as they crossed. The instructions were given to the people. It's in verse 3. It says, when you see the Levitical priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant, you know, that's the presence of God. That's God's presence literally went with them as they crossed the river. As you cross over in faith, God crosses with you. God goes alongside you. God is right there with you. But we've got to be listening to what God is saying. We've got to be listening to the messages that he's giving us. God is going to cross with you. Why does God do, do it that way? Because he could just be like, cool, you go, I'll be here. But God says, no, I'm, I'm going to go with you. Do you know why? It's because he loves spending time with you. Yeah. This, is like, this is like revelation truth. Because there's a lot of people out there who think that God has no interest in spending time with them. That's not what the text says. God loves to spend time with you. I have three kids and I love them all. They're just, you know, just growing up, starting to develop all their personalities. One thing I've learned is just in the last few years, just like every time I turn around, there's a kid, you know, in my life, like my children. Every time I turn around, there's just, there's, there's kids around. They're following me. My youngest, Charlie, is like joined at the hip. Anywhere I want to go, he wants to go. I tell him like, Charlie, we're going to go dig a ditch. He's like, great, I'm coming. I'm like, really? You really want And I love it. I'm just like, this is so cool. I've got kids that just want to come with me everywhere I go. But what I've started to learn is I actually love it. I actually look around. I'm just like, this is amazing. And I started to think about the way God is with us. And, you know, my kids, they always have my ear. They always have me whenever they need me. You know, God is exactly the same way with us. He is always listening. He is always up for some hangs. He is always ready to spend time with his kids. He is always waiting there saying, I'm right here. But we've got to be people that understand, man, we've got to listen to God's voice because God wants to speak to us and is speaking to us all the time. It's part of our crossing spirit. That God, he wants to hear from us. He wants to spend time with us, but his voice is leading us and telling us what to do. That's why we ask a question in our church all the time, okay? It's just something that we say all the time, but how is the Holy Spirit speaking to us right now? It's just a good question to frame your whole life with. Yeah. You know, when Jill and I are walking through things, we'll just ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to us right now? How, how can we be, li- what, what, what's the message? What are you saying, God? In Jesus' name. So number two, what was it? We got to listen up. Number three, we got to clean up. If you want to have a crossing over spirit, you've got to clean up. Verse five, Joshua told the people, purify yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. Let me read it to you in the Amplify. It says, and Joshua said to the people, sanctify. Another word for purify, sanctify yourselves. That is separate yourselves for a special holy purpose for tomorrow the lord will do wonders among you you know being prepared for god to move and being a good steward of what god has given you ahead of time is actually how we fight the battles well you ever notice like in war if you're going to go to a battle to go there with no armor no ammunition no, nothing would be really, really unwise. Like, is that just me? Anyone else in the room agree? If you're going to show up to a battle and you know the battle is on, you better show up prepared. I want all the ammo. Give it all to me. Why? Because we've got to get ready. And Joshua says to the people, it's interesting, he says to the people the day before, he says, purify yourself. Because tomorrow God is going to do incredible things wonderful, amazing things. How can we consecrate or purify our lives before we cross over? I just wrote a few things down. This is some ways you can get ready. If you feel like a crossing's coming, this is some ways you can get ready. The first thing you can do is pray. Be a person of prayer. Pray. Pray ahead of the crossing. Another thing you can do is steward. 
get you resources ready ahead of the crossing. Like maybe you feel like, man, you're going to start that new business. You can start to get ready now. You can start to get the resources in position now. You can start to get the plan together. You can start to prepare your heart now. You can gather the materials. Another way you can do that, if you feel like a big crossing in faith is coming, I'm going to say it, you should tithe. I'm so sorry. Didn't realize I would offend everyone. I don't know why people don't say this more often. But if God's in charge of my money, that means the devil's not. If I put God in charge of my resources, of my increase, of my financial world, that means the devil shut out. But it's a way that we can prepare. We can put God as our priority in that area. What's another thing we can do? We can change our behaviors. Maybe there's a behavior change that needs to take place before you cross over. Before you get ready to cross over, maybe you need to change up some things, a habit, a behavior that's currently an obstacle for you crossing over. Or maybe it's stopping you altogether from getting across your river of faith. Through this, relationship, uh, sorry, through this series, I feel like God's been really speaking to me about relationships with this. But I just wrote this down. Maybe you need to leave a relationship on this side of the river. And be willing to trust God that when you get to the other side, the new place, the place of promise, He's going to have the person and the relationships for you there. Because what's holding you back from crossing the river is you're holding on to these relationships. So you're holding on to a relationship and it's not healthy, it's not right, it's not of God, but it's holding you back. We've got to consecrate ourselves. We've got to purify our lives, get ready to cross over. Why? Because God is going to do wonders tomorrow. In Jesus' name. You ever feel like the crossing in faith is about to happen? But even if, you, if you're waiting, can I just encourage you? Get ready. Get ready to cross. I think that's one of the best places to be. I remember when we were getting ready to move to move stateside from Australia. We were waiting on our visas. Or Jill wasn't, obviously, because she's an American citizen. It's easy for her. You just get on a plane. But for me, I had to wait and waiting for my green card to come through and I was sitting there in Australia. But I just remember just, just saying, God, this is such a great opportunity for me to spend time with you. She'd flown ahead and she was here and I was spending a few weeks still in Australia. And I was just like, man, it's just me and God. But I began to prepare my heart for what was coming. I didn't know what life was going to be like when we moved here. I didn't know what he had ahead for us. But I was starting to prepare my heart, get things in order, get ready, get cleaned up for what God had ahead. So we've got to clean up. Number three, we've got to shift up. Shift the mindset. In other words, renew the mind. The people of God, when they crossed over, they had to think differently. There was a different mentality required. They couldn't take a wilderness mentality to the promised land. Can I just encourage you? You can't take the old season mentality to the new season that God has for you. As you cross over, there's a change in thinking. There's a shift that needs to take place. Why? Because even just think about the people of God, they were going from a survival mentality now to a battle mentality. They were going from being in the wilderness where it's just like, well, we hope the man is going to show up today. Groceries on the doorstep. Hopefully we open the door and there it is in the morning. They were surviving. They were getting by. They were going through it. But then going into the promised land, it was about overcoming. It was about possessing the land. It was about taking over and the thinking needed to be different. You got to change the way you think ahead of what's coming. Romans 12 verse 2, I love this scripture says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The old thinking won't work in the new environment. God was elevating Joshua. Why? Because he was getting him to think about what was happening, what was coming. God wants to give you a new place, but it's, it's not going to work if you have the old thinking. What are some of the old habits that need to go for you to inherit your new land? You know, some of you in here today, and judging by the way you speak, you wouldn't think that you're, you're on your way to the promised land. What am I talking about there is like the power of our words. 
Are we the type of people that understand what the Bible says about the words? That they have the ability, they have the power to build up or tear down. And by the way that we speak, we can either line our words up with our faith or we can line our words up with doubt. And sometimes I hear people speaking, I'm like, man, you don't believe that you're going to inherit this promised land. You don't believe you're going to get there because the way you talk sounds like you're never going to get there. We're going to be people that understand the power that our words can shift us up. They can take us to a higher level. They can build us up. Some things that won't work in the new land from the old, negativity won't work. That's not going to fly. It's certainly not going to help. Gossip's not going to work. Here's one that I think about a lot. You know, the, the, the good old days type talk. This is one that gets me sometimes because I, I can find myself sometimes saying, man, wasn't it good when we did that? Wasn't it good when we had that Sunday? Wasn't it good that year when we did this thing? But here's the thing is, yeah, that was great. Let's, let's, let's set up those memorial stones. Let's give God praise for the things he's done. But let's understand he's bringing about a shift. As we move over into what he's doing, we've got to understand it's going to take new thinking. It's going to take a shift in our mentality. It's going to take maybe a more positive attitude and understanding I've got to look at this differently and think about it differently. God is doing something new and it's going to require new thinking you know, I just love that thought that you can't live off yesterday's faith. I think there's part of that where it's like, yeah, that's going to that's gonna help you for a little while. You know, I think back to some of the, the great faith moments in my journey, and I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I was there. I'm glad that God did something in my life. But I can't live off this anymore. This, can't, this isn't going to sustain me. Is this, this making sense this morning? This isn't going to sustain me for what God has for me. I've got to take a shift. Number four, we're going to look up. Team, you can join me. So if we're going to have a crossing spirit, a spirit that crosses over, we've got to get up. We're going to get ready. We're going to listen up. We're going to listen to God's voice. We're going to clean up. We're going to shift our mindset. And finally, we're going to look up. And we've got to watch what God does as we cross over. Because this is what the people of God did. It's in verse 14. It says, the water's coming down from above. The water's coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away. Put yourself in the story. You're crossing over. You're moving over. You're going into the place and you, you turn to your right. You look north and you see a heap of water standing still. Could you imagine? I mean, I'm just, put, I'm just trying my best to put myself there. But what did they do? They saw the miracle of God. They saw what Joshua the day before had talked about, great wonders. They saw and they looked up and they saw the mighty miracle of God. Fast forward to today, what do we do? What are we continually called to do as God's New Testament people? What are we called to do? We're called to keep looking up. We're called to keep looking up. What are we looking up to? We're looking up to grace. We're looking up to heaven. We're looking up to the miracles that God has done. We're looking up to an almighty God that still does miracles today. But ultimately, what are we doing? We're looking up to the cross of Jesus. Hebrews 12 and verse 2 says, We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. We've got to look up. We're going to look at Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Why? Because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross. What are we called to do as we cross over? The people of God looked up and saw a natural miracle. But what do we look up and we see a spiritual miracle? We see a supernatural miracle, which is the son of God, the perfect sacrifice. Come on, church hanging on a cross for your sin and my sin, the perfect, unblemished sacrifice of God, the greatest miracle there ever was. God is God, known as the God of miracles, but the cross is the greatest miracle. The resurrection is the greatest miracle 
ever. And we get to experience its power. We get to experience its breakthrough. We get to experience the crossing over of faith into a relationship. Listen to me, friends. With Jesus. We do this every week. Give people the opportunity to say yes to Jesus. One of the things I love about this moment is it's super simple. It's not complicated. If it was complicated or if it was hard to do, then you know we would have messed it up by now. But God made it really simple. He sent Jesus, the perfect sacrifice to cover the sins of all the world. And as faith in Him, we receive eternal life. Can I just encourage you, there's nothing you can do to get in God's good graces. There's nothing that you can do that's going to change his mind about the issue. In Jesus, you're made whole. In Jesus, you're made new. In Jesus, it's all wiped clean. Everything is new. The Bible says that we're we're turned completely white from the inside out. But it's only through a relationship with Jesus that we have access to God the Father. It's beautiful. But it's so simple because we just receive everything that God has already done. And it's true. He split the seas so you could walk right through it. You know what that means? Is that all of salvation history leads up to this moment right now for you personally. That he put a plan. All of that history leads up to this moment where he saves you. And you come into a relationship with him. That's how much God loves you. That's how much he would turn the world upside down to go after just one of his children today. Isn't that powerful? I don't know about you, but that just blows me away. And he does that for every single person because every single person, regardless of background, regardless of the way they talk, look, speak, is precious in his sight. So with every head bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to make it real simple. I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, if you've never said yes to Jesus, I want to give you the opportunity to make a choice for him today. To leave the old way and cross over into the new life that God has for you. And if maybe once you did make this choice, but for whatever reason, if you're away from God, maybe you used to walk with God, but if you're honest with yourself, you're away from him. When I count to three, I also want you to raise your hand. Online, this is for you too. So here we go. I'm believing that people are going to say, yep. I'm going to make a decision for Jesus today. So here we go. I'm going to count to three. And if that's you, when I get to three, I just need you to lift up your hand high enough and long enough just so I know who I'm praying for. Here we go. One, God loves you, friend. He loves you so much. He set all of this up for you. Two, the Bible says that now is the appointed time of salvation. I believe that this is your hour. This is your minute. This is your time. Three, if that's you, come on, you just shoot up your hand nice and high. High enough and long enough for me to see it. I'll acknowledge it. Amazing. Amazing. So good. So, yeah, Pastor, that's me. I'm done doing it my own way. I'm leaving my own way. I'm going to do it God's way. Is there anyone else? Online, if you're making this choice, just type in the chat. I'm raising my hand too. And we'll see it. Beautiful. You can put those hands down. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray a prayer together. And if you raise your hand, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you wanted to, it's what I want you to do. When you pray this prayer, it's between you and God. You're not praying this prayer to me, the stage, the wall, the ceiling, some organization. It's not like that. It's between you. Listen to me. It's between you and the God who created you. And you are reconnecting in this moment for the very first time and it's amazing so let's pray together right now dear Jesus thank you that you love me thank you that you died for me and you rose again so that I could have life forgive me of my sins of all the things I've done wrong I make a choice today I'm crossing over in Jesus name amen 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 So good. So good. Well, hey, if you raise your hand, we want you to know that we're so proud of you. Jill and I, we are so proud of you for making a choice to say yes to Jesus. And this is what we know. 
It is the greatest decision you will ever make in your whole life, ever, for all of eternity. And we just want to celebrate one small way by giving you a Bible, okay? And we have these Bibles in the lobby. You can grab them on on your way out. They'll be in the lobby. Um, If you don't have a Bible and you've been coming to our church, you just don't have a Bible, can I just encourage you, go and grab one of these. Just take one of these. It's a free gift from our church. But we also have study Bibles and books and stuff like that in the storehouse. But let's give it up for those people, hey, saying yes to Jesus today in church. So good. One more thing I wanted to do just before we finish up is I wanted to pray for Haiti, if that's okay. Haiti experienced an earthquake, 7.2 yesterday, I believe, and devastation and obviously a big recovery effort's begun. And I know that lots of churches, and we're going to include ourselves in that, but are sending resources and helping with that. But we just wanted to take a moment. We did this in the last service. Just take a moment, pray for the people of Haiti. Is that okay? Can I get a nod from people? I think that's a good idea. If we pray for, for the nation of Haiti and the people that are obviously going through it right now. But come on, let's just take a moment and let's pray together for Haiti. God, we thank you for the people of that country that we know you love. And so, Father, we just ask that you would just infiltrate that place with your peace. And God, that you would lift up those people, Lord, and that you would send to them the resources they need. God, we just ask that you would send the healing that's required right now, God, for the people that are hurting. Father, we just pray that even through this devastation, that you're working miracles, that you're bringing about breakthrough, that change is taking place. God, we thank you that through this, people are going to come into the kingdom of God, that people are going to be changed, that you're going to take this devastation and you're going to make it work together for good. So God, we lift up those people to you, Lord. We thank you for everything you're doing today, right now in Haiti. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen, amen, amen. Love you, church. We'll see you soon.